FDA to change this have impacted everyone, the impacts have not been equally felt. Whether those impacts are financial, working conditions, social, mental health, physical health, lifestyle, or something else. Remember that some of our neighbors, friends, family members, local businesses, or others may be under pressures we don't know anything about. So let us all continue to be patient, kind, and understanding as we grind our way to the end of these pandemic times. On behalf of Council, I would like particularly to acknowledge and thank our municipal staff for all that they have done for our municipality, our community, through the ups and downs, the pains and losses of these times. You are appreciated. Thank you. We have a fairly long agenda this evening, including one delegation, a regular session, and a closed session. So let's get started. Introduction of amendments to the agenda. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, I do have one um, on item 7.13, uh, the second part of the uh, uh, the resolution. It says uh, the the last few words say to council by October 1st, 2022. That should be October 1st, 2021. Thank you. Uh, nothing else? Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, I have nothing else. So I uh, have a motion that the agenda for the regular council meeting of April 21, 2021 be approved as amended. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Timpson. All in favor? Carried. Just have to orient myself to where the councillors are on the screen here. Do we, uh, are we missing Councillor Fenlon? I see as well as Councillor Bath. All right, so we have quorum, uh, we have uh, five five present, so we'll carry on. Um, did you, you didn't get regrets from Councillor Fenlon, did you, Clerk? Uh, no, I did not. I wonder if he's having technical difficulties too. Um, declarations of pecuniary interest. Uh, sorry, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I have none for the open session. Thank you. Uh, a motion to adopt the, the that the minutes of the regular council meeting held on March 17, 2021 be approved as presented. Moved by Councillor Howie, seconded by... Looking for a seconder, Councillor Cassidy, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. A motion to receive the minutes of the following municipal boards, commissions, and committees. That the minutes of the Committee of Adjustment meetings held on February 16th, 2021 and March 23rd, 2021. The Economic Development Commission meeting held on February 17th, 2021 and the Municipal Truth and Reconciliation Committee meetings held on December 14th, 2020, January 18th, 2021 and February 16th, 2021 be received. Moved by. Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Howie. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Motion that the minutes of the Committee of Adjustment meetings held on February 16th, 2021 and March 23rd, 2021, the Economic Development Commission meeting held on February 17th, 2021, and the Municipal Truth and Reconciliation Committee meetings held on December 14th, 2020, January 18th, 2021. Have I repeated myself just now? I'm, I apologize. I switched from the digital version to the paper version. I apologize. Um, it is a motion to that the minutes of the Northwest Health Unit Board of Health held on January 20. 8th, 2021 be received that I need. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Howie. Discussion? All in favor? Carried. And that brings us, I think, clerk, to the determination of items requiring separate discussion. Uh, yes, Mayor Lawrence, that's correct. Thank you. 
So we'll go through the items. Uh, 7.1 Regional Air Transportation Initiative Funding Request. Councillor Lego. Item 7.2 Fire Safety Grant Application. Item 7.3 Eighth Avenue Stormwater Upgrades and Avenue Reconstruction Project Construction Contract Award. Item 7.4, regulatory bylaws for change to vehicular traffic control within the municipality. Item 7.5, Bigwood Lake Water and Sanitary Sewer Service Extensions and Curtis Street Water Booster Pumping Station Upgrades Project, 2020 Engineering Services. Councillor Timpson and Cassidy. Item 7.6, Reserves and Reserve Fund Update. Councillor Lego. Item 7.7, 7, 2020 Statement of Council Remuneration. Item 7.8, Proposal to Deem Lot 604 and Lot 605 and Lot 606 to not be lots in the Plan of Subdivision. Item 7.9, Hudson Land Sale. Item 7.10, Laneway Closure. Item 7.11, Municipal Health and Safety. Councillor Timpson. Item 7.12, Funding Information Technology Enhancements. Oh. Councillor Cassidy. Item 7.13, 2022 Municipal Election Matters. Councillor Lego. So what we have then for <clears throat> lifted items are 7.1, 7.5, 7.6, 7.11, 7 7.12, and 7.13. Did I miss anything? Nope. Good. So a motion to adopt the items not requiring separate discussion. That would be motion to adopt item 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 7.7, 7.8, 7.9, correct? And 7.10, excuse me. Uh, moved by Councillor Howley, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll now move to delegations. And we have one delegation this evening, Ontario Clean Water Agency, Johanna Kirkbride, Business Development Manager. Johanna, I see you. It's so nice to see you again. Welcome. And uh, the, the floor is yours. I see others with you. I'll let you introduce the, the team that's with you. Sure. Uh, sounds good. Good evening, Your Worship. Uh, Council and Administration. My name is Joanna Kirkbride. I'm a Business Development Manager with Aqua. Um, and with me tonight is my colleague, Jeff St. Pierre. Uh, he's our Regional Manager. Um, it is with great pleasure that we uh, are here tonight to present to you. Um, I do have, I prepared a slide deck. I don't know if I'm able to share it or if, if you all have copies and we can just speak to it. Uh, let the clerk, I'm sure you can share it, but uh, we do all have, have copies. It's uh, clerk, you, we can share. Sorry, you're uh, through, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Yes, I just changed the settings. So I believe, Joanna, okay. you should be able to share it. Sure. <laughs> Oh, 
hopefully everyone can see that. It's coming through fine. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, thank you. So um, we are here tonight to, because we know that your water and wastewater um, services con is contract year. Um, and we thought we'd take the opportunity to um, give you some information about Aqua, um, to say hello to those of you that we've met previously and to introduce ourselves to some of you who we may not know. Um, so we do have the presentation and I'll go through the slides. Um, and just to start things off, I, uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about our organization. Um, for those of you that don't know, Aqua is a crown corporation. We operate and maintain water and wastewater facilities. Um, we also manage um, water and wastewater infrastructure. So a little bit about our history. Um, we were created by the province in 1993 when the uh, provincial government privatized water and wastewater services. They um, took the infrastructure and handed them over to the municipalities um, and they said, you have three options to operate them. <clears throat> you can choose to operate the plants yourself. Uh, you can contract the services out to a private company or you can contract services out to Aqua and they created us at that time. Um, part of the reason uh, for them, for the creation of Aqua was the provincial government wanted to, um, you know, keep skin in the game, for lack of better words, in the industry, maintain a presence in the industry. They also wanted uh, the opportunity or the ability to be able to act in any case of emergency. Aqua is deemed emergency responder to any water and wastewater um, emergencies that might happen. Um, so we are a crown agency of the province of Ontario. And um, so as a council, when you're making decisions about who to partner with, um, with any of the services that you contract out, um, Aqua's deep roots in the province <clears throat> and our accountability uh, through that to the residents of this province can provide you with a level of confidence and, and a source of pride. We are held to a higher standard. Um, we, uh, we have a board of directors, so we report directly to the province through a board of directors. And we do have uh, what's called a client advisory board, which is municipal representatives um, will provide feedback and um, sort of boots on the ground information on what's really impacting them. And locally in the North, uh, we have representatives from the municipality of Greenstone, as well as the township of Horn Payne uh, that work with them. Um, so, you know, back to Aqua as an organization, we do operate water and wastewater plants. Um, we do manage infrastructure, water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, and we do hold our employees, uh, we are tasked with or held to a higher standard. And, by that, I mean all of our employees um, are tasked with a code of conduct. And that, that really is about our behavior both on and off the job. Um, and essentially, we, don't, we never act in a way that could have a negative impact on residents in the community and or the environment. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll ask my colleague Jeff if he'd like to speak a little bit about our operations staff. Uh, thanks, Joe, and, and thank you very much uh, for having us present this evening. Uh, when, when it comes to our operating staff, uh, our, our key goal is, is engagement and empowerment. Uh, we have across the Northwest region, 67 staff, and our goal for operators at the ground level is uh, cross-training and training to the highest level possible based on the facilities that they work in. And what we've learned over the years is, is the more you in, engage and the more you empower staff, uh, the more productive, uh, the more effective, more efficient, and, and uh, more engaged they are in what they do. Uh, a big part of that for us is uh, the role of ORO. I know, you know companies manage it differently, and, and when ORO responsibilities were kicked out uh, a, a while back, uh, I think managers pretty much dominated the role of overall responsible operator. Uh, but what we've done in transitioning that over the last uh, five, six years is to empower our staff to be ORO. So 
uh, it, it allows us to have an overall responsible operator in every in every facility that we operate in Ontario. Uh, of course, it it requires that they they get to a certain training level and a certain level of confidence before we can actually hand over that responsibility. Uh, but it certainly allows us to have the opportunity for multiple ORs in, in a single community, depending on the number of staff uh, that we have uh, working there. Uh, the other the other thing that we really want to do is, is make sure that our staff are, are local and engaged in community activities. Uh, we really get involved in community events and we encourage our staff to get involved in community events. Uh, we find certainly in this industry, water and wastewater operators are very caring and, and giving people. You find them in a lot of volunteer groups, especially uh, uh, volunteer firefighters. Uh, seems to be a role that, that many water operators uh, take on. Uh, so when we present opportunities to be engaged in community events, uh, of course, COVID has definitely uh, slowed us down with that respect over the last year. Uh, they're, they're all up to volunteering their time and participating in community events and, and really uh, work to be members of the community, not just contractors within the community. So uh, that's how we really view our entire operations team at Aqua. We, we, we hope that we uh, are engaged enough in communities that, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, for one big family, and that uh, we, we take home with us the responsibility of ensuring that uh, water and wastewater services are uh, productive and safe uh, for the communities that we, we partner with. We, uh, a part of our training, uh, we have minimum standards for, for training 40 hours a week, or sorry, 40 hours a year uh, for staff overall. And then of course, all your director approved uh, hours required to maintain licensing. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and I, I should mention, and I forgot to say it at the beginning, um, I was a little nervous <laughs> this evening. We, we do welcome any questions that you might have for us. Um, we'll open the floor up at the end. Um, and hopefully, you know, I know that Zoom presentations, we're in this new world of online delivery, they can be a little dry sometimes. So hopefully we you know, we can um, engage a conversation with you um, towards the end or, or answer any questions. Uh, that we may not cover while we're speaking. Um, so the next topic that I wanted to talk about this evening is municipal modernization. And it's a word that you often hear these days. Um, it's a bit of a buzzword. We know there's funding that, that has come out from municipalities um, on modernization. And you know, a lot of the questions that you may ask yourself, so what does that mean? And how do we do that in our smaller communities where resources are really limited uh, to begin with? Um, one of the ways in, in which Aqua can help you with modernization of municipal services is um, it, with our shared services model. Um, and what that is, is when uh, the government created us in 1993, they also created a one of a kind um, model where, you know, direct operations staff that Jeff was speaking about earlier are located in your community and that forms a part of the, the cost of doing business with Aqua. But there also is another layer to that um, that forms part of the agreement and that's specialized services. So folks like scientists and process optimization specialists, marketing, um, IT, legal, all the types of resources that you don't need every day um, but when you do need them, they cost a lot of money because they're specialized technical um, service. So with the with Aqua as a partner, you have access to all of those resources, you know, engineers to do um, guidance and review documents and, and whatnot. Um, you pay a portion of that throughout the length of your agreement. And when you need those that support, it is there for you. A, an example of you know, if you're wondering, well, how could marketing uh, really help in, in our community in Sulico? Um, an example that, that we've done is this year with, there's a lot of uh, wipes that have been flushed and it it's, can wreak havoc on your municipal infrastructure, your pumps and, and um, your linear assets. So uh, we have a huge I Don't Flush campaign, it's called. You may have seen commercials about it partner with other municipalities, but we really deliver a lot of that messaging and give those resources over to our municipal partners to use on their social media accounts. So um, marketing and, and tools that they can use to advise or remind residents that, you know, 
yes, we're in a pandemic and there's a lot, uh, uh, a lot more use of things like, like wipes and Clorox wipes, but they aren't safe to flush. There's only three things that we should really be uh, flushing. Um, another example of municipal modernization and how Aqua can support with something like that is in our bulk purchasing. Because Aqua, um, we operate over 900 facilities throughout the province, we buy things like insurance and chemicals and um, engineering services at, in bulk, lab services. And then you pay, when you have that kind of buying power, you, you pay a lot better, a lot more, um, a lot less, not a lot more. <laughs> so, and then in turn, we can pass that, that savings on to you as our partner. Um, so some of that, you know, I know that there's been funding and some municipalities have explored doing a modernization review, reviewing contract options with your water and wastewater services is some one option that municipalities have chosen to take advantage of with that funding that's come out and or because um, it's milestone building. Um, so they can undertake a review and use an example of Aqua and their shared services model that they have. Um, Jeff, do you want to talk about some innovative tools that we have, some of the... Certainly, certainly can do that. Uh, in Aqua, I mean, the, 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 from the corporate perspective, Aqua is continually working with partners uh, for innovative opportunities uh, that are a little bit more grand than the things that, that I get into. They're uh, different treatment processes, different wastewater treatment processes, different ways of doing things that are, are a little bit larger scale than, than ourselves. We are typically, uh, you know, small town, uh, Northern Ontario uh, operators. So the tools that, that we engage mostly in are, are right at the ground level. And, and some of those things are we've transitioned into a, uh, a maintenance software system. Uh, it's an IBM product called Maximal, which is, allows us uh, to really drill down our, our maintenance practices, uh, particularly on the recording side and the delivery side of reports. Uh, we've stepped that up uh, over the last couple of years to handheld technology, uh, which we've found is a great advantage uh, for operators when they're in the field. I think some of the, the maintenance items that get missed uh, that are being completed are things that operators are doing in the field. And they don't bring that information back to the office and sit and, and, and take the time to record it. So by going to mobile technology, it allows operators to, to really grab the blood and guts of maintenance, which are corrective actives, uh, corrective uh, actions as opposed to just irregular PMs and scheduled PMs. Uh, so we found that, that, that we've been able to take this information and develop monthly reports, uh, electronic reports for council uh, that cover things like irregular PMs or corrective PMs, uh, any major maintenance or minor maintenance going on and and call outs uh, which which uh, I think council has found very important to review what is going on with their uh, in their facilities uh, lately we've we've turned to electronic log books uh, this is something that we're almost hundred percent engaged in the northwest uh, I think we only have three facilities left to get trained up and out there and uh, that's from a from a compliance perspective uh, has been fantastic it, it's really, it's taken away the paper, the paper log books gone completely uh, electronic. Uh, there are several safeguards to which, which eliminate uh, operator error when it comes to actually physically logging in a paper log book. But the biggest thing that we found is it allows ourselves uh, the ability to monitor any facility from any location at any time uh, and also develop electronic uh, reports for clients and or uh, the MECP for inspection. So, We've taken a lot of time away from MEC inspections by way of being able to provide them with this information electronically, as opposed to needing to remove log books and, and take the time to go over those with inspectors. Uh, and the safeguards behind that, there's a million different little things that you can uh, utilize to document in these e-log books. And it's just been a fantastic upgrade for us uh, with respect to compliance. Uh, we have an electronic uh, process data collection system. It's, uh, it's called Whiskey, uh, which allows us to download uh, real-time numbers into spreadsheets and, again, to provide to clients uh, lab analysis uh, and, and to the MECP for upcoming inspections. Uh, 
and and lastly, we we've really uh, Aqua has upgraded their their SCADA system. So we piggyback predominantly uh, municipal system SCADA systems. And again, it's a it's an opportunity to download information, but again, allows managers uh, to to review uh, uh, operations from anywhere in the province at any given time, as long as they got a, an internet connection. So this is just some of the innovative tools that we have. There's a there's always a lot going on. This this it's ever changing with uh, with what's been going on with COVID, and and always looking for a better way to monitor and keep our facilities safe. Thank you, Jeff. Um, the last point that that I wanted to go through and review with you was the uh, the hot topic of municipal infrastructure funding. I know uh, most of the time when we're looking at either new uh, infrastructure or um, upgrades, it's very challenging to do anything without funding from uh, either the provincial government or, or a partnership of uh, both. So um, part of Aqua's mandate, um, as I mentioned earlier, as a crown corporation that operates like a business, we are given what's called mandate letters um, every year. Um, and a part of that is um, you know, an initiative to support municipalities with infrastructure funding. Um, we do that in a number of ways, but one of the ones that we've found um, has been really beneficial um, is to assist with applications for managing funding um, and or sourcing it out. So what we do is we establish relationships with the different funding programs and organizations in the industry that focus primarily on energy and water and wastewater infrastructure funding. Um, and we sort of keep a bit of a, a ear to the ground in terms of things that may be coming down the pipe. And we work with our municipal partners to make sure that they are shovel ready. So we will recommend things to public works through the CAO to come to council um, that we, we may see as long-term projects that you're gonna need to invest some significant money into. So if we can identify them early on um, and have you know, feasibility studies or assessments completed in the initial stages, when the funding program is announced, you're shovel ready. You've got that evidence-based um, assessment or study that you can include with your application um, that um, along with the relationship with the funder to kind of review applications and talk about, you know, what sort of things should we be really be including in these to, to make it a winning um, application and get that feedback. They're happy to help and support where they can because ultimately that's their mandate is to give out these infrastructure and make really good decisions on which projects they're funding. Um, so we've been able to do that and kind of be a bit of a, a support um, and a bridge to that. The other thing that we've, we've done over the last couple of years is take on that service for the municipalities. So write the applications for them. Um, you know, if we have 10, uh, that we're writing, that's a lot more effective than 10 different economic development officers writing their own from scratch. We have a lot of people that we're talking amongst, so it's there's a sharing of ideas and and sort of um, uh, you know focus on on what types of things we feel are likely going to get approved. If you are approved for funding, um, one of the supports that we will provide with that is um, reporting. Every funding program and, and all the administrative staff are well aware of the amount of reporting that's required. It can be a lot. It can be a full time job. And that's taking a resource away from the municipality that may be needed elsewhere. And that kind of ties back into the whole modernization and efficient use of resources. So we'll do, you know, we'll review the invoicing and we'll put all that together um, for municipalities to not only try and um, give them a better shot at getting the funding, um, identifying the projects that it should even be included and supporting council with those decisions that they're, they're having to make. But also on the tail end with once the project is announced, project managing that work and overseeing it and providing guidance and advice and administrative support on reporting and, and financial submissions for that. Um, so that's, um, the, you know, really the highlights of what we wanted to talk about. Um, I hope that we, you know, we were able to leave you with 
enough information. Maybe you learned a little bit more about Aqua and kind of what we do. I know it's, you know, our 15 minutes of fame uh, this evening, but it's not a long time. Um, but we would certainly welcome any questions that you might have for us. Thanks, uh, Johanna. Maybe we'll go back to uh, the full view, uh, Clerk. Thanks. And uh, I'll uh, go around the, uh, the council table with any questions or comments. Councillor Lego. I'm just wondering if uh, we worked with Aqua regarding our CTU uh, grant that we put in, our application that we put in that was uh, declined. Um, there's a, a large bill coming forward for the residents of our community. And uh, I was just wondering if we had worked with them uh, on that grant application. Is that no, a question? Uh, sorry, is that a question for Aqua or for uh, staff? Um, whoever can answer. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably staff, I would think. Yeah, I think the answer is going to be no because uh, we don't have a contract with Aqua at this time. But uh, uh, where's staff? Um, uh, Michelle, it's, go, go ahead, please. Thank you. Through you, Worship, I will defer to Andrew to answer that question he put in the application. Consulted for with a uh, our. Um, Sorry, we missed the beginning of your 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 talk, uh, Andrew. Could you start again? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, no, we didn't uh, consult with Aqua on that application. We consulted with RVA out of Sudbury. Uh, they were doing another job for us, and they just provided us a brief uh, cost estimate. But other than that, the application was uh, completed and submitted by myself. Thanks, Andrew. Councillor Howie. Uh, no questions. Councillor Lego basically answered my my question surrounding previous relationship with Aqua. So thanks, Councillor. If I may add to that, Your Worship, um, and just in, in speaking with, with Andrew, so, and I should have mentioned during my presentation, uh, the support that Aqua provides, we work with our current uh, municipalities. So, because we're not operating the water and wastewater systems in Sulica, we wouldn't have been able to support you in that way, just not knowing your infrastructure needs at this time. Thanks, uh, Joanna. Yeah, uh, councillors who worked, we, we tender this out every five years. It's a five-year contract for our, our, our water and, and sewer systems. Um, so ACO did submit a proposal uh, on the, the last uh, uh, RFP, I guess it, Aqua, you might know this better, or Andrew, I'm sure knows, but it, roughly four or four and a half years ago, um, and we're coming up for an, another cycle of, of uh, calling for proposals for a five-year contract. Uh, so Aqua will, I'm sure, be submitting, as will uh, our current provider, Northern Waterworks. There's essentially only, as far as I know, only two agencies, firms that are capable of providing the service we, in this, this part of the world uh, that we were calling for. Uh, Northern Waterworks in Aqua. So had Aqua had the contract, uh, Aqua, uh, I'm imagining Andrew might've worked with them on that. I think that to help answer that question. Councillor Timpson. Uh, no, thank you. It was interesting. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, no, um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you also don't have any questions at this time. Thank you, Councillor Fenelon. I have uh, not, no questions for it. Thank you. So I think we've been around the, the council table. Um, anything mm -hmm. to sum up, uh, Joanna? Well, just, uh, you know, thank you for the time. I, I know you have a long meeting, so we, we really appreciate it. We may have gone over our time allotment, <laughs> so I do apologize. Um, you know, if there are any follow-up questions later on, we, we did, did uh, supply the presentation by all means through, through Michelle um, or, or Andrew, we'd be happy to answer anything that you might, that might come up later on. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joanna. I'll just ask uh, through CAO to Public Works, Andrew, when is the, uh, the cycle coming up for, for a request for proposal? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, the, uh, in the month of May, the next council meeting, I will be presenting to you a proposal from our current uh, operating authority 
for a potential execution of a five-year extension of the current contract. And that will be the first step in uh, pursuing a further contract. Um, so that's the first. And then depending, pending council's uh, decision uh, uh, with the report presented in May would uh, then further indicate whether we're going for public tender again or whether council chooses to uh, accept a contract extension for additional five years with the current uh, service provider. All right, thank you. So it was timely that Aqua made a presentation. I'm, I'm guessing you knew that, Aqua. So thank you very much for requesting a delegation and presenting tonight. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jeff, uh, Joanna, and staff. Yeah. And have a good night. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, Council, we're into uh, staff uh, reports, the consideration of items. Um, Requiring separate discussion. And we'll start with item 7.1. The council authorizes an application to FEDNOR under the Regional Air Transportation Initiative, RATI, to offset 12 months of operating costs. I'll need a mover and a seconder to put this on the table. So moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. And discussion starting with Councillor Lego. Uh, I think uh, my first question would be in regards to the 2020 deficit of close to $600,000. Um, is, is the airport getting some of the money that we received, the $1.2 million for COVID relief that we just received uh, a couple months ago? I don't know if uh, the CAO or, or Ben mm -hmm. can answer that. Answer that. Okay. Sorry. Go. Go ahead, Carly. No, uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, the first round of money of the just over $303,000, $127,000 was allocated to the airport to help offset um, their fee. And then um, around $400,000 from the second round was um, used to offset the remaining amount, knowing that we could use a, a small portion of that uh, funding that we received. Uh, that being said, however, the $1.2 million that we did receive, the whole entire amount, we have yet to receive any sort of feedback from the government as to exactly how much and where we can use all that funding. So we're still waiting on them. So we know exactly what we can use the remaining amount for. Does that answer your question, Councillor Nagel? Yeah, and uh, just to follow up, uh, the 929,973, that, yeah. that, is that the uh, amount you're submitting for reimbursement for 2021, or I guess it's for a 12 month period. Okay, I'll, I'll go, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, through you Mayor Lawrence. Uh, no, we're gonna ask for a little bit more than that. <laughs> uh, no, but we're, we're gonna go in, we're gonna go in at uh, just over 1.1 million. It's actually $1,123,704 is uh, the number we've, uh, we've established based on the forecast and the revised forecast. And it gives us a little room as well. Um, so yeah, we're gonna ask for a little bit more. And there is no contribution from our side either. This is straight up, uh, straight up money. Good, that's good to hear. Thanks, man. And just to clarify a little more, just so you know what that 12 months is, um, what we did in order to get to that number is we took a six month block out of 2021 and a six month block at the end of 2021 to capture our, our, most, uh, our most expense right through winter operations so we can get the best bang for our buck. Thank you. Councillor Lego. That is all for me. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just go around the table. Councillor Howie. Oh, thank you for clearing that up. And, um, and I don't have any questions. I support this application. Thank you. Councillor Timpson. No, no questions. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. 
Uh, no, you answered my question, Ben. Thank you. I'm very glad to see something roll out for airport. So this is great. Councillor Fenlon. Nope, I have no comment on or questions. Thank you. I just have one question. The, the it's a regional, and the, you've specified in your report twenty four million for the northwest. The two busiest airports in the northwest are Thunder Bay, followed by Sulacote, and then a significant drop down to the next air, airports in terms of uh, flights in and out, etc. Is that correct? Extreme Airlines, you're right. Absolutely. Uh, Thunder Bay would be the largest, and then it would hit us. Uh, there, no, they explain at the northwest region of that twenty four million is spread out from Geraldton to the Manitoba border. But keep in mind that airlines uh, can apply to this funding as well. Air operators can also apply. So we're not just competing with the airports, we're competing with the air operators as well. Right, right. I was gonna say based on the you know, passenger movements and, and uh, I would guess if that was how they were doing doing it, we would get our share. The, the amount that you're asking for would seem to be reasonable, but the competition is greater than just the airports. That's correct. Okay. Well, here's hoping. Uh, thanks. Uh, if there's nothing further, I will uh, call the vote uh, on item 7.1. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Item 7.5. Uh, that council awards the contract for engineering services pertaining to the detailed design specifications, construction tendering and contract administration for the Bigwood Lake Water and Sanitary Service Extensions and Curtis Street Water Booster Pumping Station Upgrades Project to KGS Group in an amount of $247,000 plus HST. And further, the council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 35-21 being a bylaw to authorize and direct the mayor and the clerk to execute an agreement between the corporation of the municipality of Sulacote and KGS group for the detailed design specifications, construction tendering and contract administration for the Big Wood Lake water and sanitary sewer service extensions and Curtis Street water booster pumping station upgrades project. I'll need a mover and a seconder to put that on the table. Moved by Councillor Fanlin, seconded by Councillor Timpson. And the discussion will start with Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I just had one question for clarification. It uh, indicated that the project is over budget. Will that just can be coming out of our long-term debt? Uh, to, to you, Mayor Lawrence, if, if that question was directed to me, um, I, I, I would like to redirect it to the treasurer. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. As of right now, yes, the extra fees will most likely have to come from long-term debt unless we can find extra funding that's available that we can allocate to this project. Anything further, Councillor Timpson? Oh, that's all. Thank you. Then I'll go to, I think it was Councillor Cassidy. Sorry. Yeah, um, that was kind of my question as well. With, with regards to the engine engineering fees, I was wondering if with the, the 247000 that uh, is in this contract, if there's anything extra that we're getting with some of the oversight in any of the other stuff where we could realize savings, but uh, sounds like th this is coming in a bit over budget. Um, th to you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, if I could say one thing, one part of the, one component of the, the cost um, that was um, presented by KGS includes uh, site inspection services during construction for 960 hours. Um, there is the opportunity there that perhaps with uh, this type of construction being somewhat of a structural build for the water booster pumping station itself, that there could be a reduction in, uh, in site inspection time. So there could be savings there. Um, the 960 hours that uh, I specified in the RFP is uh, typically just what, um, the hours that I allocate for uh, for any large construction project, giving an entire construction season more or less. So there could be the opportunity there uh, for some savings. And another uh, item that, that just came to me and that I would have to discuss with the treasurer and CAO, of course, um, is that the, the, the Curtis Street water booster pumping station is existing infrastructure 
um, water and sewer related. So perhaps there's the opportunity there to uh, uh, have council's approval or present a report to council that uh, an opportunity to use some utility reserve. Um, that component of the project isn't like economically driven or whatever. It's a component of our existing infrastructure that requires an upgrade and it likely will be required an upgrade at one time or the other. So that's something that we can investigate to offset uh, potential uh, uh, costs in terms of how um, the, the remaining balance outside of the funding uh, could be dealt with. But that's for further discussion. We could discuss that internally and then perhaps um, come back to council with uh, that as an opportunity or as an option, I guess. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor Cassidy? No, oh, that, that was great. That was kind of where I was going with it. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. I'll just check the other councillors. Councillor Howie? No, thank you, Andrew, for your explanation. Councillor Fenlon? Yeah, no, I have no comment on it. No questions. And Councillor Lego? No, just. Uh... What we're what we're putting into it is, is relatively low compared to what we're getting for grants. So, but I would like to see that uh, if they can get some, uh, if it, if it does go over, that we would look at maybe, like Andrew said, the utility uh, reserves to to pay for some of the some of the uh, uh, construction. So, it's a, it's a good idea. Well, it's appreciated to hear that. All right. Thank you. Anything further, Council? Okay, so I, um, I think you've heard a few ideas and, and uh, CAO staff will be getting back to us on that. Yeah, thank you. All right, I'll call the vote then. All in favor? Carried? Thank you. I believe we're on item 7.6. That council receives the 2020 reserve and reserve funds update as included and attached to the treasurer's report number 2021-59, dated April 21, 2021. And we'll need a mover and a seconder to put that on the table. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Fanlon. And discussion starting with Councillor Lego. Well, it's, it's a question I ask every time the reserves come up. Um, are we gonna be dealing at some point with the boat launch uh, outstanding debt to 41,000? I know that last year we dealt with the cafetorium, so it's sort of the last thing that are, is on our books that we need to get rid of. So through you, Mayor Lawrence, the one thing that I am waiting on is uh, the final audit report from the auditors to determine whether or not we have a surplus or a deficit at the end of the year. From that, depending on what that um, surplus may or may not be, uh, Talk will be with the CAO in regards to possibly using some of that to pay off that reserve and bring it back up to zero. And then we'll be looking at other, other avenues in regards to the reserve and the reserve funds in the future. Good, Councillor Lego. That's everything, yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council, Councillor Howie. No, well put, Treasurer. Um, thank you. No questions. Councillor Timpson? No, no questions. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy? Yeah, with the, um, with the municipal accommodation tax, is that the total amount we get? And we'll have to share half of that with the with another agency? Is that, yeah. sorry, just check, is that part of the reserve fund that's in there? You. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I can you repeat your question again? Yeah, no problem, Carly. With the uh, the municipal accommodation tax, is that the total amount we collected, and then we'll have to split that up now, or is that our half? Yes, through you, Mayor Lawrence. So, how the uh, the MAT tax reserve works is all the funds that we receive automatically goes into the reserve fund. From there, we will divvy up 50% of it to um, the tourist company that uh, the CAO and I are currently working on the agreement with. They'll receive 50% and then we'll keep 50% of what's in that account and council can 
uh, decide at a later date what exactly they'll use that funds for. Did we not decide that that's going to the land reserve to cover the expenses for the town beach? Mm, no, so through, yeah. That was that was discussed, and it was decided that um, we would finance the long-term debt from the mat tax on the waterfront uh, project. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just asked uh, for, if not a clarification, when you said the tourist company, this isn't an individual private tourist company. It's a. Uh, could you explain that that term just so there's no misunderstanding? CAO, uh, yes. Um, right now, we're um, we've gone back and forth about two or three times with the Chamber of Commerce, and what it will be will be a subcommittee under the Chamber of Commerce that will comprise of um, a tourist um, operator, um, a hotelier, a member of the Chamber of Commerce, a member of the public, and one member of our staff um, on that committee that will determine. Um, how those funds will be dispersed and a budget will be submitted to the municipality for approval um, every year. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I don't think I, I've touched base with all the councillors except Councillor Fenlon, I think. No. No, I have no comment on it or questions. Thank you. Uh, did I leave anybody out? I'm sorry. Nope. Any further comments, Council? Then I'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. I think we're now on 7.11. And that is that council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 34-21 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 54-20 being a bylaw to establish a health and safety policy manual for the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacote and to adopt certain health and safety policies. I'll need a mover and seconder to put it on the table. Moved by Councillor Timpson, seconded by Councillor Fenlon. And discussion starting with Councillor Timpson. I had a, a couple of questions. Um, under the pandemic policy, I didn't notice there about uh, if, for example, if a person is identified as a contact of someone who has has a contagious disease and they are required to isolate they may not be sick but they are required to isolate is that, what, what is our policy for uh, payment a salary payment for uh, individuals in that situation uh, it may be covered under our human resources policy I'm not really sure but through you, uh, Mayor Lawrence, would you mind repeating that, uh, Councillor Timpson, with reference to if they're if they're contact traced and the retired required to stay home? Is that it? Yes, if they were a contact, but they aren't sick, but because they are a contact, they're required to isolate. So what we did in the onset uh, of the um, of the pandemic last year, and we continue to do, is what uh, we've done is afforded every staff member five quote unquote COVID days. So um, because under the new requirements now under the, the, uh, the uh, new legislation, if uh, somebody has presents one of the symptoms then everybody in that household has to stay home until a negative test comes back. So we have experienced that with some of our staff and we're allowing five uh, COVID days over and above their normal sick leave time or any bank time that they have to take. So that usually is sufficient. Um, so what we've experienced so far is only the staff have only had to stay home for one, maybe two days max, because the test comes are, are the test results are coming back much quicker. Okay, thanks. Um, question about the violence. Um, I think it was a sorry, but I think it was under the refusal to work. You've gone. You've gone. You're on mute, Councillor Timpson. Timpson. Yeah, under under the refusal to work, and I think violence is one of the reasons why a person could refuse to work if there is a threat of violence to them. What about if they are in a situation where they feel it's emotional violence or harassment? 
Is there some provision there? Yes, we have that. There is that provision as well. Um, if they feel threatened in any way, whether it be emotional or verbal or actual physical, then they have the right to refuse work or work with that individual until that situation is cleared up. Thanks. Anything further, Councillor Timpson? Was that it? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else uh, around the council table with, I see no hands up. So I'll just let, uh, take this to all in favor. Carried. Thank you. Item 7.12, funding information technology enhancements. The council authorizes the transfer of $8,000 from the information technology reserved to fund the purchase of 95 additional client access licenses, providing that such funds are not otherwise available from the COVID-19 funding supplied to the municipality by the provincial government. A mover and a seconder, moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Lego. And I'll start with Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, unfortunately, this one got answered for me in 7.1. Uh, it was around the, uh, the COVID funding and usage of it and the treasurer already answered that question so i have nothing further thank you thank you um did anybody else have any questions on on this item councillor label yeah um if we do find out that we can use uh some of the COVID funding for this and we've already paid the money out can we put that money back into these budgets uh through mayor lawrence yes um the uh the money will be uh the the purchase will be uh, finance through the uh, general operating fund because then usually it's at the end of the year when we do all the transfers to and from reserves. So um, we would certainly know by by the end of the year whether that we're able to use the COVID funding or whether we actually have to proceed with the transfer. Thank you, Brian. Around the table, Councillor Howley, anything? Nope. Councillor Timpson. Uh, no. Thank you, Councillor Fenlon. No, I have no questions. Thank you. I'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item 7.13. The council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 37-21, being a bylaw relating to 2022 municipal election matters. Language or languages to be used for election forms, notices, information, use of alternative voting method, use of vote counting equipment and further the council directs the clerk to complete a ward boundary review and report findings and recommendations to council by October 1st, 2021. A mover to put that on the table, moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Lego. And the discussion will start with Councillor Lego. Yeah, um, just a question um, regarding the voter role. How, how do you know if someone needs to be taken off? How are you contacted? Uh, so uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, uh, so the, the voters list is provided to the municipality uh, by MPAC, um, and that list is updated uh, uh, between each election based on information that MPAC receives about uh, people changing addresses or selling their homes and, and that kind of stuff. As you can appreciate, um, it's it's far from um, a perfect process, um, and and we've certainly had uh, a lot of frustrations in the past with uh, with the voters list and people not being on it or people on it who shouldn't be on it uh, for whatever reason. So, um, what we do during the uh, uh, the revision period, as we call it, when people are able to uh, to make revisions to the voters list, uh, we 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 publicize that. We encourage people. Uh, we have the um, a module on our website where people can go in and they can put their um, their name and, and address and it'll tell them whether or not they're on the voters list and if they're not uh, then they just contact uh, the office of the clerk and uh, and we work with them to make sure they do get on um, there is also um, a fair bit of um, 
Um, the clerk uh, has the uh, discretion to make some revisions to the voters list based on information that uh, would be available um, to to him. Uh, so for example, uh, we can look at cemetery records, for example, and uh, if we know that someone is deceased and shouldn't be on the voters list anymore, then, then we can remove that person. Um, so, um, but uh, just one other note on that, and not to belabor the point, but um, the provincial government has announced that uh, for the 2026 election, there will be uh, Elections Ontario is going to take over uh, the voters list, and there will be a shared list for uh, provincial and municipal elections. And so, uh, all of uh, all of us election administrators are um, very hopeful that uh, we're going to start seeing much improved lists uh, starting in 2026. It would have been nice if it was ready for 20. 22, but that's not going to be the case. So, um, again, we uh, our ask to the public is that you know when the time comes, check to make sure that you are on the voters list, and if you aren't, uh, you know please please reach out to us so that we can uh, make sure you're uh, you're able to vote if you're eligible. Okay, uh, one more question: If someone owns property in the community but does not live in the community, um, are they eligible to vote? Uh, there's a number of criteria, so the criteria is pretty pretty low. Um, they they can own or live in the municipality. Uh, so, for example, uh, people who uh, are a tenant, um, they live here but they don't own property, so they're still able to vote. And and the converse is also true. If uh, they own property but don't necessarily live here full time, uh, and they meet the other criteria, then they are um, eligible to vote. So, do they have to have a driver's license that states that? Because uh, could they vote in two different places if they're just a tenant here and they live elsewhere? Um, yes. Okay. That's how the election law is set up. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite quite legal. Is that to they could vote, be voting in five different places if they own property in five places and lived lived in one five different municipalities and lived in the six they could vote in six six places. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, any other further questions? I'll go around the table. Uh, Councillor Timpson. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, question was answered. Councillor Lego. Nope, sorry. I've been I've been to you. I'll keep going around the screen here. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Howie. Yeah, I did have a, a question uh, surrounding the um, notices that are distributed to the community. Could we expand the notices um, beyond just English, French, and Ojibwe to include Ojibwe and Cree? Yeah, so uh, that'll be a determination um, that uh, that I'll make um, at the time of, uh, of of making that information. Um, we'll look at what we've done in the past um, and uh, its effectiveness. Um, I can tell you traditionally we we don't go uh, ahead and make those translations because the utility um, and the request and the uptake has been extremely low. Um, when you do a cost benefit analysis. Um, the, the cost uh, for doing that translation uh, traditionally doesn't um, um, isn't offset by uh, you know uh, a benefit uh, of, of the same degree. So um, certainly I'm open to that, and uh, we're also um, open to providing um, interpreter services if that's necessary for people to actually vote. I think that would be a more cost-effective option. Um, uh, would be anyone who would, would need that type of assistance that we we could look at providing that. So uh, those are all types of uh, considerations that we that we do look at. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fenlon. No, I have nothing. No. Thank you. I think, uh, Councillor Thompson, I've been to you already? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Then, if there's nothing further, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of items requiring separate discussion. So we will go to um, bylaws. Mr. Clerk, how are you feeling? I feel great, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, dying to speak at this point. No, uh, if if you would like, I would be happy to uh, to read the, uh, the the bylaws that are uh, listed for uh, for adoption this evening. 
I'd be ecstatic. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, so bylaw number 28-21 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 1071 being a bylaw for the regulation of traffic to relocate existing stop sign at the intersection of the Mill Road and Goodley Lake Road in Hudson, Ontario. Uh, bylaw number 2921 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 1071 being a bylaw to regulate traffic within the municipality of Sulacote uh, to implement uh, an eight meter long no parking restriction on the south side of Queen Street between 5th and 4th avenues. A bylaw number 30-21 being a bylaw to deem lots 604, 605, and 606 on plan uh, 23M239, Municipality of Sulacout, not to be on a registered plan of subdivision. Uh, bylaw number 3121 being a bylaw to authorize and direct the mayor and the clerk to execute a transfer payment agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacout and Her Majesty the Queen and Right of Ontario as represented by the Minister of, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm used to saying Minister, uh, as represented by the Office of the Fire Marshal for a Fire Safety Grant. Uh, bylaw number 3219 being a bylaw to authorize and direct the Mayor and the Clerk to execute um, um, agreements and documents regarding the sale of the here and after described land by the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulaco to Peter Ridgeway. Uh, that's the 6th Avenue property in Hudson. Bylaw number 3321 um, uh, being a bylaw to authorize the conveyance of certain hereafter described land by the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulaco uh, to Peter Ridgeway and direct the mayor and the clerk to execute the transfer. Uh, bylaw number 34-21 uh, being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 54-20, being a bylaw to establish a uh, health and safety policy manual for the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacote and to adopt certain health and safety policies. Bylaw number 35-21, being a bylaw to authorize and direct the Mayor and the Clerk to execute an agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacote and KGS Group for the detailed design, specification, construction, tendering, and contract administration for the Bigwood Lake Water and Sanitary Sewer, sewer <coughs> pardon me, Service Extensions and Curtis Street Water Booster Pumping Station Upgrades Project. Bylaw number 36-21 being a bylaw to authorize and direct the Mayor and the Clerk to execute a contract between the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacote and Makinga Contractors uh, for construction of the 8th Avenue Stormwater Upgrades and Avenue Reconstruction Project. And finally, bylaw number 37-21, uh, being a bylaw relating to uh, 2022 municipal election matters. Oh, sorry, Mayor Lawrence, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, we need a mover and a seconder to put the, the bylaw section on the table. Moved by Councillor Howie, seconded by Councillor Fanelon, and I will call the vote. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Notices of motion to reconsider? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I have none. Outside resolutions, requests for endorsement? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, no members of council have uh, requested anything we put on the agenda uh, this month. Thank you. So we're into reports from councillors. Um, and I'll just uh, start around with Councillor Howie. Thank you. I've participated in uh, several discussions over the phone uh, with members of the community regarding certain issues that have come across uh, our table, uh, participated in the Economic Development Commission meetings, and uh, continue to support the uh, vaccinations uh, throughout our region. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Timpson. Uh, yeah, I've been to uh, two um, KDMA meetings, the uh, Kenora District Municipal Association they have submitted resolutions to NOMA, the resolutions that were passed at the KDMA annual meeting. Uh, I've attended to two uh, Northwest Health Unit conferences, uh, keeping updated on the uh, pandemic situation in the area. Uh, several hospital board meetings. Uh, the big issue with the, is with the hospital is them keeping us up to date on the pandemic. Um, there is a section set aside at the hospital. Uh, it's the former addictions unit that they are putting anyone who tests positive who needs to be in hospital. They've been putting them in this, uh, this is a very small little ward. Uh, a lot of the, I think some uh, um, detections of 
of, of positive cases have come from people simply coming to the hospital for something else. So if they have to stay in the hospital, then they stay in the, uh, um, the, the ward. Uh, staffing is a big issue. However, uh, they're relying on agency staffing so that in the event that uh, the hospital would have to take uh, patients from else, COVID patients from elsewhere, uh, they're uh, feeling they're uh, quite confident that they will be um, adequately staffed. Um, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Committee. Um, We've formed a couple of subcommittees that are going to be looking at various uh, various issues. Um, Environment committee, we put put together an article. Uh, one of our new members actually put together an article for Earth Day. I hope it got into the uh, newspaper, but I'm not sure. Um, if not, it'll be next week. Uh, we're planning for the mow free lawns for the spring to help protect, bring some awareness of the value of bees and the value of keeping uh, not totally mowing laws in order for the bees to have a place where they can pollinate the dandelions, etc., and the wildflowers. Um, we have three healthcare professionals on our on our committee who are adamant that we not proceed with the curbside swap. Fair enough, I was very glad that they were um, advised as, as such. Uh, I took a trip out to Hudson and tried to find the sledge ponds the other day. I couldn't find where they were going to be and the road was, road was just too hazardous to keep going. And I wanted to find the one in Hudson as well, but I couldn't find it either. However, I did try. It was a nice day for a uh, nice day for a, a drive. And uh, just a, aside, on the Friends of Cedar Bay are um, very busy in uh, in uh, getting the upgrades to the stable area. The uh, we've got a contractors in place. We're going to have. You outhouse. You you go on mute. Yeah. Thanks. We're gonna mute. I'm on mute. Okay. And um, yeah, and some electrical work will be done in the barn, so that the once the pandemic is over, we can we'll be able to start offering equestrian services to the community and to the schools and the tribal councils. So that was my month. Thank you, Councillor Timpson. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, um, no daycare advisory committee, that's in May. Environment committee, I prepared a presentation for the environment committee about the composting survey that uh, went out and working on developing a bit of a strategy for some information out, information for the public to be, or to be available and uh, just some, maybe some documentation, some info documents that we can use as promotional material based on some of that stuff. So it was uh, a lot of good feedback from the survey. So we have some good information to work with there. Um, and I also sat on the ECDEV um, meeting today just to, to get an update on and see where things are. And it was a good update. So that's about it. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Fenland. Is that me? Yes. Okay. Um, I had a, well, I attended uh, two committee of adjustment meetings for this month and uh, for uh, minor variances and LCC meetings. So I had three of them this month. I missed one and uh, uh, dealing with the wood supply in the forest. And I think that's it. Oh. Yeah, special council meeting. And that's it. Thank you, Councillor Fenlon. Councillor Lego. Yeah, uh, same as Councillor Fenlon. Uh, two uh, committee adjustment meetings, the special council meeting. I uh, had one uh, district uh, home for the age meeting on March 25th. Again, everything's related to COVID and the stay at home and the shutdown. 
and, and funding that's coming to the long-term care homes, which is greatly needed. So, uh, and then I have another meeting next week with the, the uh, Home for the Age as well. So. Thanks, Councilor Lego. Um, for myself, I've uh, participated in Kenora District Services board meeting. Uh, we've had several municipal uh, COVID coordination committee meetings, I think three in, the, in since the last council meeting. Um, and those are seem to be going quite well in terms of the agency cooperation and updating. So uh, several media interviews with the Bulletin and CBC and CKDR um, participated in the Northwestern Health Unit uh, municipal uh, update uh, teleconferences that are available to any of you. I think you all get the invitation if you if you want to sit in. I know Councillor Timpson does. Um, participate in the vulnerable population uh, group uh, calls with the CAO. Uh, attended an economic development uh, special meeting uh, that was a presentation in cooperation with Lakehead University on newcomers, let's say. Um, a Northwestern Health Unit board meeting. Uh, participated in the OPP detachment commander selection and the OPP had a media release that went out today uh, finally which uh, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, detachment commander is Carl Duell, inspector Carl Duell and coincidentally we had a, a scheduled police uh, services board meeting today in which uh, we publicly welcomed inspector Duell. He's been he's been here was here as early in his career uh, for several years, uh, and then came back in 2018, uh, 20 years or so later, um, and uh, truly uh, likes uh, Sulakot, lives here with his family, and I think will uh, serve us well. Um, I participated had a chance to present to the parliamentary, the not the the Ontario Legislature Legislative Standing Committee on finance and economic affairs that came together rather quickly, but uh, and, and uh, our MPP, uh, Saul Mamakwe, was instrumental in helping us make that presentation and support us during the presentation, uh, in which presented on um, uh, mental health and addictions, the need for, for facilities and, and the treatment center here, on uh, the long-term care facility, and it was quite uh, timely that the uh, the chair of uh, Manayowan, Sadie Maxwell, and the uh, executive director, Heather Lee, had just sent a letter to Minister Fullerton, uh, a short, succinct, to the point letter saying, basically, we're disappointed and quite offended that uh, you didn't find room for us on this year's budget for long term care, um, asking for resolution to that. Hmm. And uh, I think I mentioned NOMA, some various NOMA meetings, Truth and Reconciliation Committee meeting, a Friendship Accord meeting, and Special Council meetings. So, um, all in all, it just keeps on taking away. And that brings us to a motion to move into closed session. And I think what we'll do is take a, once we're, clerk, once we're in the, the breakout room, we'll take a, a short break. Certainly. Okay. So we'll, uh, we need a motion to move into closed session. Uh, the council moves there at uh, 6.50 p.m. to discuss matters of a general nature, subject matter relating to a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality as three items. One, proposal to purchase property in Hudson. Two, property east of the airport. Three, proposal to expand local business. Subject matter relating to plan, procedure, instructions to be applied to negotiations. One item, negotiations respecting facility use. And finally, subject matter relating to personal matters about identifiable individuals, including municipal or local board employees. One item, council boards, commissions, and committees membership. Need a mover to move into closed session and a second. Move by. I just need to just second. I, my screen is blocked a little bit by the breakout room. There we go. Moved by Councillor Howie, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. All in favor? Carried. So we'll now join. Yes, please click join.